meet here at 5 p.m. Uh, Sue Bocock is going to be teaching a 10-week Bible study on Hebrews. There's an a.m. and p.m. option, so if you can't come in the morning, you can come in the afternoon. Um, and it starts on August 17th, and there's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center. So if you have any questions, uh, see, please see Sue Bocock. And also shared uh, more details on that on Facebook this morning, so check that out when you get home. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to be observing the Lord's Supper during uh, the morning worship service. And the budget committee will be meeting uh, next Sunday morning following the worship service. Um, so please see Bob Kennedy with any questions. He might even be feeding you. Where's Bob at? Are you feeding him? Okay, and he'll be feeding you. I know usually you do, so Bob will take care of you. So um, we are glad to have you with us today, and I'll turn it over to Devin. Good morning. We're glad you're here with us to worship God uh, this morning. If you're visiting or watching online, uh, we're glad that you are, have chosen to join us this morning. Uh, let's stand as I read God's word, um, as we read Psalm 104, verses 33 and 34. Because uh, today we're going to be focusing on God's Word, on meditating on it, on learning it, on, uh, on reading it and studying it. Uh, so that will be the focus of, of Corey's sermon. Uh, so Psalm 104, verse 33 says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. And that's what our music is always based on Scripture, and it's our meditation on God's Word. So this morning, uh, join with me as we sing and worship Him. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together loving, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly. Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came to the earth you created All for love's sake became poor So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, 
You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Amen. You can be seated. Uh, as I said before, uh, today we are talking about God's Word, and so today's uh, meditation of prayer comes from uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. It says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And this morning, Brother Corey is going to talk about not only the importance of God's Word, but the gift that it is. God has communicated to us in a way that we can understand or begin to understand, get a little grasp of who He is. So it is, you cannot overstate how important it is as believers following Jesus and, and in the family of God who say we love Him to know His Word. Jesus said, any of you who know my word and follow my commandments, you're the ones who love me. So this morning, let's pray through that scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. God, thank you so much for your word, for taking the idea of you, some one that we cannot even begin to comprehend, and communicating it to us in a way that we can begin to understand. Father, we are so grateful for the way that you reveal not only yourself to us in Scripture, but reveal our need of you, our position before you in Scripture, that nothing is hidden from your sight. We are all exposed, and there's not any person or any deed that will go unknown. And Father, we thank you that we can know you through your word, that it, you give us guidance, that we could build community uh, built around truth and love and everything that you communicate to us in the Scriptures. And I just pray that you would open our minds to your Scriptures, Father. Fill us up with truth and help us be willing to take out anything out of our minds, out of our worldviews that is not truth, 
that comes from our sin nature or our opinions and the world around us, Father. I just pray that you would make us creatures of truth, um, focused on your word and who you say you are, not who we think you are or who we imagine you to be. But God, I pray that you let uh, help us let your word um, form our picture of you in our minds, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, that we would know you for who, le- tr- who you truly are and not who we want you to be or who we think you ought to be. Uh, and in that same sense, Father, help us to know ourselves, our need of you, our capabilities that you've created us with, the gifts and talents that we have that you reveal to us in your word, that we could know you better and make disciples and find community and serve others, God, and be the people that you have created and called us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, stand with us again as we um, sing more worship to him. Uh, We're going to sing How Marvelous, because when we think about God, who he says he is in his word, like, we can't even begin to comprehend who he actually is. Like we can't picture God. Anytime we have a picture or an idea of who God is in our minds, we're probably wrong in some sense as far as like we can't know what he looks like or no man has seen the face of God. So we're this morning I just chose how marvelous because that's all we can say. How marvelous, how wonderful. We can't even begin to comprehend. So we're going to sing the chorus, and I want you guys to... Start singing with us and we'll join you with the instruments. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my say his love for me he took my sins and my sorrows he made them his very own for the burden to Calvary and suffer time alone. Everyone sing out. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how And with the ransom in glory, his face I at last shall see. It will be joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my say his love for me myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the 
last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say, word of God speak, that you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty. Be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Finding myself in the midst of you beyond the music beyond the noise and all that I need is to be with you and in the quiet hear your voice the word of God speak that you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see your majesty To be still and know that you're in this place Please let me stay and rest in your holiness Word of God speak, would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's so Amen. God, thank you so much for your word. Again, for who you are, for who you have revealed yourself to be. And we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's do the head count. Fifteen is the number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I really didn't. I thought you were close. Oh, we got. We got like our. All right, all right. I get her gone. I get her gone. <clears throat> so, <laughs> that was a surprise. I'm finding myself for a loss for words. Funny thing is, it's okay. All right, so. <laughs> Um, we sang a song for y'all to came, come down front. I want to share a camp song. I was at camp all week, right, Charlie? Or try camp, Bellamy? Uh, and um, so one song I learned at um, camp when I was young was this song, and I'm going to teach it to you. Uh, some of you have heard it, some of you haven't, but it, it goes like this. It says, the word of God is like a little bee seed scattered all around. The word of God is like a little bitty seed scattered all around. I can see there's some on the roads, some on the weeds. Everywhere I look, there's an itty bitty seed. The word of God is like a little bitty seed scattered all around. I learned that. You had a voice crack. I had a big voice crack. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> I learned that 32 years ago. Wow, and that song is stuck right here. But it's so true that the Word of God is like a little bitty seed. And I've got a pack of little bitty seeds here. And we're going we're gonna to plant them in here. And uh, I'm going to kill it later, just so you know. But um, 
Uh, now, I, I have a pack of seeds, but the Word of God is like a little bitty seed, and it is scattered all around. And we have a passage in the story in Luke chapter 8. Jesus tells this parable about a man who sow, is a sower and some seeds. And he talked about the, the types of soil, and we are the soil. That's what he's talking about, that, that God wants to plant seeds in our life. But then he tells about three different types of soils. Well, actually four, but... One, he says, is packed down soil. It's the, it's the path. And, 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 and this is the one that, that applies somewhat to y'all, but let, let's, I'm going to be honest. This applies a little less to y'all because you haven't been around very long for life to pack you down. And, and that's why sometimes it's easier for, for young people like yourselves to receive God's word. It's because the world, world hasn't, hasn't, haven't, hasn't stepped on you. But, but let's just say like this, is, this whole path, this whole uh, batch right here is, is your life and sometimes life is hard and it packs us down just like a fist or a shoe and it packs our heart sometimes people do mean things that we just have a hard time getting over and, and that can kind of get in our way from God's seeds kind of going deep because God's word says you should forgive and there are those in this room that would go brother Dan you don't know what you're asking you don't know what they did see that's the packing down of their soil so sometimes we need to ask God to, to, to unearth or to break up our soul. And we need to ask hard questions like, who really is Lord of our life? Do we really trust God? Do we forgive others? Those are some big questions. You know what they do? Is they break up the soil. They kind of bring things to the surface that God can put us in there. And then it talks about rocky soil. Rocky soil. And so... So let's look in here and see if there's any rocks. And they, oh, there's, there's a rock in there. That's a big old rock. See that rock? There's, a, there's one rock. Let's see if there's any. Oh, Marco. They said it. Y'all didn't. What's up with that? So you said, Paul. oh, I'm sorry, Eva. But uh, there's, there's another rock. And there's another rock. And what do those rocks say? Sin. sin. See, when I have sin in my life and I have things... They're in my life. See how that left a big old hole? When I have sin in my life and I have things that I don't want to give up, I've, I put things in place of God. I've, 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 I've not prioritized. I've, I've made basketball and kickball and friends too important. And, and I, I watch things on TV that I know I shouldn't. And I've heard friends say dirty words and maybe I repeated them or even thought about them for a little bit. So when I have sin in my life, he says, when you have sin in your life, then, then, then when I put seeds in there, then they'll grow down and they'll hit that sin. And I'll go, wow, Brother Corey was right today and I should do that. And then, when, then but you know, I don't really want to give up what I want to do. So it kind of, it says it doesn't take root. And so it springs up like, oh, that's a great sermon. Oh, I should do that. It's like camp sometimes. We can hear a, a good sermon and go, wow, that's great. I should do that. And then we get... Oh, and the roots kind of hit some of that sin in our life, and instead of dealing with our sin and getting rid of the rocks, we just kind of leave it alone. And then our, it, it withers and dies, is what he said. And then there are some weeds. And the weeds are... Now, we didn't see the sin. That, right? that was inside. But the weeds are outside. The weeds are our friends or maybe bad friends or people around us that, that don't help us do good things and... And we need to deal with that. We, need to, we don't need to be unkind, but maybe, just maybe, we need to uproot some, some people that have, have taken over our life. And, and when we say, hey, I'm going to church, I can't believe you're going to church. Why don't you go to the baseball game? Why don't you don't, I mean, we're going to the park. Why, why would you go to church? And maybe we need to stay, start saying no to some of those friends and invite them into church. But when we, when we get done with all that, what do we have? We get, we, yeah, we get, a, we get nice, clean soil. We get nice, clean soil. We, it, we've got rid of the rocks. We've kind of, we've got turned it over and we got rid of the weeds. Now, now we can take the seeds, little bitty seeds. I said they were little bitty seeds. You can hardly see it. Oh, it's just, it's starting to fall. Watch watching, watching. Come on, seeds. <whistles> see them falling? Hard to see. Now, there they all go. Now, if I took that bucket of good soil 
and I sat it out in the parking lot today, what would happen to some of those seeds? Well, some of those seeds, I bet there'd be a bird or two that'd be coming by looking for some food, wouldn't you say? So we need to poke those seeds deep into the soil. He says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. I put it deep in my heart so that I might not sin against God. And when I, when I turn that over and I put it deeper in the soil, it's a, now it's a little bit more protected. When I take God's word and I put it in my heart and in my, heart, in my mind and I think about it a lot, it takes root a little quicker. And it's less likely for birds or other people or the wind to blow it away. But now it's in the soil, just like God's word needs to be in our heart. So let's ask God to, to help us with that because we want to be good soil. We want to, we want to deal with the rocks, the sin, and, and the, the weeds, and, and the, the packed down soil. Then we need to hear God's word when we listen to our teachers in Sunday school or Brother Corey or children's sermons. And we need to take it deep in our heart and think about it a lot and let it take root. So let's ask God to help us with that today because sometimes that can be hard. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us, for giving us your word. It is so good. It teaches us how to be like you, how to find hope and peace and love. Father, it helps us make wise decisions. Father, help us hide it in our heart. Father, if our heart has sin in it, or if we have friends or outside people that, that are distracting us, Father, help us deal with that today. So we may hide your word in our heart. I love you, Jesus, in your name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, Miss Suzanne's going to take you all upstairs. Now the choir is going to come. It's going to share a word song with us today. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is He, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, His tender words I hear, and resting on His goodness, I lose my doubt and fear, though by the path He leadeth. But one step I may see is I is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Is I is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to sighing, when hope within me dies, 
I draw the closer to him. For now he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing Amen. Thank you, choir. I enjoy hearing our choir after last year. You don't want to take anything for granted anymore. Isn't that the truth? So thank you, choir. We're going to talk about meditating on God's Word today. And we'll continue our series, Relapse, How to Overcome Temptation. Um, we need to know how to overcome temptation so we can stay close to God and grow in our relationship with God. And so uh, today, uh, I'm going to share with you the, the secret to the single most important thing that has helped me grow in my relationship with God. Now, that's a mouthful, I know. But when I sit back and I think about what God has used to draw me closest to Him, uh, it is meditating on Scripture. Uh, what, if I, what if I could show you how to experience spiritual renewal and grow in wisdom and have a joy and a passion about life to follow a pure and righteous path, to experience sweet fellowship with God, to heed warnings and gain a reward, and to be cleansed and blameless? Now that is a mouthful, right? But that's exactly what God's Word describes when it comes to meditating on Scripture. I want you to look for just a moment, Psalm 19 in the Old Testament. Psalm 19, we're going to look at verses 7 through 14. Now let me say as you're turning there, let me give you a, an immediate image that I want you to think of when we talk about meditating on God's Word. A lot of times when we hear the word meditating, maybe we've got somebody that's doing this, um, you know, uh, we have certain images thanks to Hollywood and media. But here's the thing, in many of those cases, people that are meditating are trying to empty their mind and concentrate on something. We're talking about filling your mind with God's Word. So when I talk about meditating on Scripture, I'm talking about how to fill your mind with God's Word so that it can benefit you. In Psalm 19, uh, look if you will, uh, it says this. It says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. See, that's one benefit. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the experienced wise. There's the wisdom. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad, and the command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up, thus joy and passion. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, and the ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. There's that pure and righteous path. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. Um, that's that sweet fellowship with God. 
In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. So you heed warnings and you gain a reward. And then it says, who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. So whether it's obvious sins, whether it's unintentional sins, if we will get the Word of God in us, it will keep us from both of those. And then after seeing all those wonderful things about the benefits and the value of God's Word, in verse 14, the psalmist says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love that verse. Uh, May the meditation of my, ha- uh, my heart be acceptable to you, Lord. Uh, what a powerful verse that is. Now, I want to give you a couple of promises about uh, meditation before we get into this this morning because I want you to realize that again when I say what is the single greatest thing that has helped me grow in my relationship with God I could list a lot of things okay I could list church and I could list camp and I could list a youth group and I could list you know reading the Bible and praying and Christian friends and I could go on and on and on but the single greatest thing that God has used to draw me closer to him is meditation on God's Word. I'm going to show you how to do that. But before I do, I want to show you why it's so important. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, I'm going to give you two promises from the Bible that emphasize why meditation on Scripture is so important. In Joshua 1, verse 8, the Bible says, This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it, for then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Now that is God speaking to Joshua, who was the successor to Moses. And here is Joshua, and God is telling him, don't let my word depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you can carefully do everything it says. And then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Now, let me say it this way. How many of us as parents have caught ourselves, you know, if you make up your mind and you decide what you want to do in life, you can do anything you want to. Is that true? Just throwing that out there for a minute. Just let's, let's look at that statement for a minute. Maybe a better way to say it is this. How about if you will seek God and do His will for your life, and meditate on His Word, you will be successful and prosperous in whatever you do. Fill in the blank. Whether you end up, you know, uh, working in a factory, or working in the field as a farmer, or working in the city, or, or whatever you do. Now, I mean, think about that promise. He says, you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. But what's the condition? Meditating on God's Word day and night, and doing what it says. That sounds good to me, don't it you? I mean, that, there's value there. God says if you want to succeed and prosper in whatever you do, then you get your focus on me. You obey my word. You do my will. But you meditate on my word day and night and do what it says. And I'll be with you wherever you go. That'll be the key. I'll be with you. That's why you'll prosper. That's why you will succeed. Let me give you another promise from God's Word about the value of meditating on God's Word day and night. It's found in Psalm, Psalm 1. Out of the 150 chapters in Psalms, this is the very first chapter. It really sets the tone for everything else. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead... His delight is in the Lord's instruction, and, here it is, He meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever He does prospers. Now we have a picture, don't we? We have a mental image of this tree beside a stream, 
It's got a water source, and so it's always getting its, its needs met. It's getting its proper nutrients, and that tree is growing. And when the springtime comes, it blooms. And then when harvest time comes, it, it's produced fruit, and its leaf leaves do not wither. And whatever it does, it prospers. God is saying, do you want your life to be like that tree? That you're always fruitful? You're always in season. You're all, you always have what you need and you're a blessing to others. Well, then meditate on God's word day and night and whatever you do. Now, notice that word whatever. That's the second time that's come up in Joshua 1 8, now Psalm 1 3. Whatever you do, you will prosper. Now, that really gets, you know, that, that really, you know, grabs me because see a lot of people think well that meditating on scripture stuff that's just for you know your pastors and that's for your your Sunday school teachers that are studying their lessons I you know I really don't like reading and that's that's not really for me but this Bible verse here in Joshua and in Psalm that it's saying for everybody that if you, if you will personally meditate on God's Word day and night, then wherever you go, whatever you do, you will prosper, you will succeed, you will be fruitful, you'll be blessed. Now that's God's promise to us. Now let me give you one last example. Now I'm going to jump to the New Testament, and I want us to look at the life of Jesus. Now I will admit what I'm about to share with you is not explicit, but it's implied. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the temptation of Jesus. And uh, I want you to see it here because, you know, he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And look what happens in Matthew 4, 1. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, let that sink in, he was hungry. So would I, right? And he says, then the tempter approached him and said, if, now I'm going to emphasize certain parts, that if is a big word, okay? So the devil tells Jesus, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He appeals to his natural inclinations. He appeals to his physical senses and appetites. But he puts a, a, a spin on it. He says, you know, if you are the Son of God, he knew who he was, but if you are the Son of God, why don't you prove it and make these stones become bread? I know you're hungry. And what does Jesus say? He knows the devil is up to no good. He knows he's tempting him. And he answers, it is written... Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And uh, then the devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if, again, there's that if word, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Now, now at this point, the devil has upped the ante. He's like, oh, you're going to quote scripture to me. Well, I'm going to quote scripture to you. And so now he says, if you are the son of God, why don't you throw yourself down? Because it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you won't strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus, if you really are the son of God, why don't you just jump? The angels will take care of you. Then I'll know. By the way, I coded scripture. Ding. You know, I mean, he's really trying to tempt Jesus here and he's quite skilled at it. But what does Jesus say? It's also written, do not test the Lord your God. Boom. End of, end of that story. And then again, in verse eight, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, I will give you all these if you fall down and worship me. You know, Adam had sinned, and so the devil moved into territory, and the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world, and so the devil is claiming to have right over all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, look, Jesus, I'll give you all this if you'll worship me. And Jesus sees through it, and he says, go away, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and the angels came and began to serve or minister to him. And so many times we look at this text and we go, well, Jesus fought temptation by quoting scripture. That's absolutely right. And many times we say the reason why he could quote scripture is because he memorized it. And that would be true. 
But I want to look at verse 4, and I want to say what, what's implied here. The first scripture that Jesus used was in Matthew 4, 4, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, what does that scripture imply? It implies that you and I need to meditate on God's word. How many times do you eat a day? Well, I prefer to eat three. Sometimes I prefer to eat more. But that's a whole other story, right? But, but you eat three square meals a day. You eat regularly for nourishment. But when it comes to God's Word, how often do you crack the book? When it comes to God's Word, how often do you take time to get your mind into God's Word and let God's Word get into your mind? He says that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That implies that I've got to take God's Word, I've got to eat it, if you will, I've got to digest it, and it's got to have some kind of personal benefit for me. And the best way to do that is to meditate on God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. So let me, give you a, let me give you a visual today of what I mean by meditating on God's Word, and then I'll show you how to do it. Uh, meditating on God's Word is like a cup of tea. You probably go to the grocery store if you ever uh, buy those uh, boxes of the Lipton tea with the tea bags, you know, and you get you out a, a, a coffee mug or something, heat up your, your water, and then you, you dip that uh, bag of tea uh, in, that, in that mug. Now, you can't just go one and pull it out and expect to have tea. It doesn't work that way, right? You could go one, two, three and take it out. That's okay. But boy, when you take that tea bag and you sit it in that hot water and just let it sit there, the longer that tea bag sits there, the more the flavor of the tea permeates the water, right? Well, this analogy is what it means to meditate on God's Word. Your mind is the cup of hot water, and God's Word represents the tea bag. When you hear the Word of God, it's like taking one dip, dipping it in, pulling it out. When you uh, read the Word of God, when you study the Word of God, when you memorize the Word of God, two or three more dips. But when you meditate on God's Word, you're putting it in there, completely immersing it, and you're letting it soak until all the flavor of the tea bag permeates the water, and now you've got this beautiful cup of tea. In other words, meditation on Scripture is letting the Bible brew in your brain. Let me say that again. Meditation on Scripture is letting the Bible brew in your brain. You're really thinking about it. Uh, Adrian Rogers said it like this. When you hear a song that really gets in your head, you go through the rest of the day thinking about it, singing about it. That's what it means to meditate. You start thinking about it and thinking about it over and over and over. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. Charles Spurgeon said, I query out the truth when I read, but I smelt the ore and get the pure gold out when I meditate. For lack of meditation of the truth of God runs by us, and we miss and lose it. Our treacherous memory is like a sieve, and what we hear and what we read runs through it and leaves but little behind. And that little is often unprofitable to us by reason of our lack of diligence to get thoroughly at it. I often find it very profitable to get a text as a sweet morsel under my tongue in the morning and to keep the flavor of it, if I can, in my mouth all day. In other words, Spurgeon is saying when I read the Bible, I don't just read it and close the book and check, check the box and say, well, I did what I should today. No, he says when I read the Word of God, I try to get a morsel under my tongue and put it in my mouth and keep it there all day long. In other words, I read the Bible... And I look for something that jumps out at me and I take that one thing, that one thought, and I think about it and pray about it all day long. And that's what it means to meditate. Let me give you one more uh, passage of Scripture in the Psalms. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in, in the Bible, and we're only going to do a portion of it. 
See, that's just to make sure you're awake out there, okay? All right. Did he say the longest chapter? How long is this sermon? Oh, hang on, we're almost done, all right? So anyway, the longest chapter in the book of Psalms is Psalm 119. It's a beautiful poem about God's Word. You'll see these weird little uh, things ever, eight or so verses. What the, uh, what the person did is he took the Hebrew alphabet, and for each letter of the alphabet, he did a stanza, a poem about God's Word. And so we're going to jump in at verse 97 through 104, and look at what he says about God's Word. He says, How I love your instruction. It is my meditation All day long, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders, because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Here's what I want you to see in that short passage. I want to give you four results, four results of meditation of God's Word. Number one, you become wiser than your enemies, okay? Look what he says there in verse uh, 98. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they're always with me. In other words, when you meditate on God's Word, it'll make you wiser than your enemies. You might say, well, I don't really have any enemies, You have three, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world and the flesh and the devil will always pull you further away from God if you allow it. And so we need wisdom to stay close to God and to continue to grow in our walk with God. So meditation on Scripture helps us become wiser than our enemies. Another benefit is it gives us more insight than your teacher's. Now, I understand I've got a lot of educators in the audience today, and that's a big, bold statement. But God's Word can make you have more insight than all your teachers. Why? Because you're meditating on it. You're meditating on it. The only way I can illustrate that is years ago, they had a a speaking contest. And this young man got up. He had memorized the 23rd Psalm, and he got up there, and he was a great orator. He had a great voice. He could project He was dynamic, and he got up there, and he gave it his best shot. And everybody's kind of, yeah, he's he's all right. And then here come an old man. He hobbled up to the podium, and he began to quote the Psalm, 23rd Psalm, from heart. He kind of messed up a little bit. He cried a little bit, but he quoted from heart. And when he got done, everybody cried, and everybody stood up and gave him a hearty applause. And somebody said, What's the difference between the young man who knew it word for word and the old man that gave it from his heart? And someone said it's simple. The young man knew the psalm. The old man knew the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, right? And when you are meditating on God's Word, you don't just know the Bible, you know the one that it points to, that it speaks about, and that's Jesus Christ the Lord. And so yes, when you meditate on God's Word, you can have more insight than your teachers because you're not just thinking about God, you are meditating on His Word and talking to God. Think about that. A third benefit of the meditation of God's Word is you can have more understanding than your elders. That's mentioned in verse 100. Why? Can, how can you have more understanding than your elders? It says, because I obey your precepts. Now think about that. You might have other people that have more miles on the highway of life, and thus they have more experience. But if you obey God, that's the only experience you need. Think about that for a minute. If you obey God, that's the only experience you need. And then, of course, he goes on and says, I've kept my feet from every evil path. I've followed your word. I have it turned from your judgments Um, and all of that. I would say the fourth benefit, the last one here, is to enjoy a holy life. It's one thing to live a holy life. It's another thing to enjoy it. And when you read those last four verses, Psalm uh, uh, 119 verses 101 through 104, it seems to me that not only is he living a holy life, but he is happy. He's happy that he's living a holy life. He is enjoying it. I found a little uh, quote this week. I, I don't know who to attribute it to, so I'll say it's unknown, but it sums it up. It says, we must read Scripture every day, 
and meditate on what God said to fight temptation from the world and live a life that's spirit-led. Let me, let me say that again. We must read Scripture every day and meditate on what God said to fight temptation from the world and live a life that's spirit-led. And that's so true. So very quickly, this ain't going to take long and this isn't rocket science. I'm going to give you three pointers on how you can meditate on God's Word. And you can do this. It's not mechanical. Ma- ma- matter of fact, it's quite natural. If you or a worry wart. If you're a person that struggles with worrying, you're meditating. It's just going against you rather than for you. You know, think about it. When you're worrying about something, you're focusing on it, you're rehearsing it, you're rehashing it, you're playing it in your mind over and over and over and over and over. Well, that's meditation, but it's, it's negative meditation. Uh, we want positive meditation, things that are going to serve you well and not hinder you. So how do you meditate on God's Word? Number one, you read. You read. Thomas Watson said, reading may bring a truth into my head, but meditation brings it into the heart. Think about that. Reading may bring a truth into the head, but meditation brings it into the heart. Well, you've got to have it in your head if you're going to get it in your heart. So you have to read God's Word. And when you read God's Word, read it slowly. Read it carefully. Read it prayerfully. Let me give you an example Earlier in my message, I quoted, uh, I read Psalm 19. And I want to go back to Psalm 19 and look at verse 14. Just that one verse where he says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, I could read that if I was doing this on my own. I might read that two, three times just to really get it in my mind. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm reading, if I really want to focus, I have to stop and reread that paragraph. I might have to read that paragraph two or three times just to really get you know, my, my mind on it, my attention on it, and no distractions. Whatever works for you. But read, read it slowly. Read it carefully. And read it prayerfully. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Spurgeon says, read the Bible carefully and then meditate and meditate and meditate. Now, what did we mean by that? Well, the first thing we have to do is read. And then the second thing we do is we reflect. Spurgeon said, meditation is the reading like digestion after eating. The cows in the pasture eat the grass, and then they lie down and chew the cud, and they get all the good they can out of what they've eaten. Reading snips off the grass, but meditation chews the cud. Therefore, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Wearsby, Warren Wearsby said it this way, What digestion is to the body, meditation is to the soul. It's not enough merely to hear the word or read the Word. We must inwardly digest it and make it part of our inner person. I heard an illustration once. The difference between a butterfly, a botanist, and a bee. You know, a butterfly loves flowers, and it'll go and it'll float, and it'll land on a flyer. It'll linger for a minute. It'll go to the next, and it'll flitter around, and it'll go from flower to flower to flower. A botanist They will take a notebook, they'll have a magnifying glass, they'll come to that flower, they'll look at it, they'll examine it, they'll observe it, they'll study it, they'll take copious notes. But then there's the bee. The bee, he lights on a flower, and he sinks down deep into that flower and extracts the nectar and the pollen, and then he leaves. He arrives empty, and he leaves full. You and I need to be like the bee so that we can truly draw uh, nourishment from the Word of God and meditate on it and do what it says. Wearsby says, the more you meditate on God's Word, the more truth you will see in it and the more direction you will get from it. That is so true. Let me go back to my verse again give you another example. Um, Psalm 19, 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. If I was going to meditate on that, I'd think about what are the words of my mouth like? Lord, are there any words I'm saying that I shouldn't? And I'd pray about that. And then I'd say, 
What about the meditation in my heart? Lord, am I pondering things? Am I thinking on things that I shouldn't? Am I holding on to things that I need to let go of? And I'd pray about that. And then it says, be acceptable to you. And I'd say, Lord, I've thought about my, my words. I've thought about my thoughts. Lord, I want to be acceptable to you. I, I want to make sure that everything I say and do is pleasing to you. And I'd pray about that. And then I'd think about what Lord means, how he's Lord of all. Okay, he's Lord of all. And then I would think about the image here of my rock and my redeemer. God is my rock and my redeemer. And I want to show you how this works. You could meditate all day long about what does it mean for God to be my rock and my redeemer. You know, you can get online. You can go to an online concordance and you can type in a word that you want to see how many times it appears in the Bible. And you can put it in the search there of an online concordance and it'll tell you how many times that word uh, comes up in the Bible. Well, I did a little bit of that, and I wanted to make it very short and sweet for you. So let me just say it this way. In Psalm 19, we've been looking at this verse. If you look at Psalm 18, right there, right there across the page from it, in Psalm 18, verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Wow, there's a lot there when you say, God is my rock. Psalm 18, go on down to verse 31. For who is, who is God besides the Lord and who is a rock? Only our God. In other words, there's only one rock and he is God. And then you go down a few more verses in the same Psalm. Psalm 18, verse 46. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. The God of my salvation is exalted. And so God is my rock. In Psalm 62 verse 2, he says, He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. Now there it is. You can meditate all day long. God is my rock. And because he's the only rock, because he lives forevermore, he is my rock, my salvation, and I will never be shaken. And then you think about and meditate on that word, you know, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What does it mean when it says redeemer? I'm reminded of a passage in 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 Peter 1, 18. Peter says, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And since you have purified yourselves by obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love, one another constantly because you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So two things stand out in what Peter says. I have been bought. I have been redeemed, not by perishable things, not by silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And because I've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, I now have been born again by the word of God, which is an imperishable perishable seed. That seed goes down in my heart, like Brother Danny was saying, and it produces a harvest of righteousness. And now I am born again through the living and enduring Word of God. Man, that is so good. So how do we meditate on God's Word? We read it. We read it slowly. We read it carefully. We, we, we read it prayerfully. And then we reflect on it. Just start thinking about what you read. Start thinking about what it says. You know, if it paints a picture, think about that picture. If there's a word that jumps out to you, then think about what that word means. But just think about it and pray about it and reflect on it through the day. Now, again, I'm explaining something, and it's going to sound mechanical, but I promise you it's quite natural. When you hear a song and you think about it, you you've heard it, so you've read it, and then you start reflecting on it, and then you keep reading 
reviewing it. You keep bringing it up all through the day. That is meditation. So the third R of meditation, you've got read, reflect, and review. Andrew Murray said, holding the Word of God in your heart until it's affected every phase of your life, this is meditation. In other words, it's the tea bag that rather than just dipping it, you put it down in that water and you let it soak. That is meditation. Let me go to uh, one last verse here. Psalm, Psalm 1. We were there earlier. I'll go back to Psalm 1 and I'll close. In Psalm 1, it says that if we delight in the Lord and we meditate on His Word day and night, then, verse 3, we are like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever He does prospers. Again, here we have a picture of a tree by streams of water getting its nourishment, getting its needs met. The leaves don't wither. The, fruit, the, the tree produces fruit when it's in season and whatever it does prospers. Is that the kind of picture of the kind of life you'd like to have? Well, I want to read this one last quote from Henry Blackaby. You know, the guy who wrote Experiencing God. He said, Scripture is wonderful if you meditate on it. Let me say that again. Scripture is wonderful if you meditate on it. Our problem is we read without meditation. Your life will never be anchored like a tree without meditation. Your life will not be anchored by a river of living water until you stop and meditate on God's Word. It's the one who meditates on God's Word day and night who becomes like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You might say, well, I've grown up in church. I've read my Bible. I know the Bible stories. I've, I've sat under good teaching. I've had good Sunday school teachers. I've had good preachers and pastors. That's all fine and, and dandy. But it's not about just knowing it. It's about meditating on it day and night. Do you meditate on God's Word day and night? Do you read it? Do you reflect on it? Do you pray through it? Do you let the Bible brew in your brain? Do you really meditate on it? Because God says, if you do, if you meditate on my word day and night, if you think about my word throughout the day, like you do your favorite song, then you'll have a sense of my presence. You'll have a sense of purpose. You will, you will, you will draw on my strength and my power that I give you through the Holy Spirit, and I will bless you. you you'll be successful, and you'll pro prosper in whatever you do. Now, that's what God's Word says. And Henry Blackaby, the guy who ironically wrote Experiencing God, said, Scripture's great if you meditate on it. It's not enough just to have it right here. It's not enough to study it and have notebooks full. You've got to meditate on the Word of God day and night. You've got to digest it and process it just like you would a good wholesome meal because man does not live on bread alone but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to challenge you. Let this next year be your best year by meditating on Scripture. You don't have to be smart to do it. All you have to do is be persistent. Read a verse of the Bible. Read a chapter of the Bible. And when something jumps out at you, start thinking about it. Start reflecting on it. Start praying through it. You know, like that one verse I just used right there. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Think about that verse. Read it. Reflect on it. Review it. Pray through it. And let God speak through you. I want to have a time of invitation. I want to ask you to stand as musicians come. I want to encourage you right now. Take this verse, Psalm 19, verse 14, and ask yourself right now, Lord, show me my words. Examine my words. Lord, examine the meditation of my heart. Lord, if there's anything that's not pleasing to you, Lord, I pray that you would show me so that I can, I can get rid of it and I can pursue you. Lord, I come before you today.
And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each person through this message. Lord, I pray that we'd be challenged to meditate on your word day and night. And Father, I pray if there's someone here today, Lord, that's never took that first step to trust and follow you, then Lord, I pray right now that they'd be willing to make that, that, that step. If you're watching today and you never took that step, I pray right now that if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, if you're ready to turn from your sin and surrender to Christ, then you might say, Lord, I come before you. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know, Lord, that if I stand before you someday, I'm going to be judged as a sinner condemned to hell. But Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the grave on the third day. And I believe that if I come to you, Lord, I trade my sin for your righteousness. And now I can be right with you and I can have a relationship with you. And so, Lord, I surrender to you today. I turn from my sin and ask you to come into my life. And, and maybe you need to pray that prayer today. Maybe that's the step you're in right now. Whatever it is, Lord, we come before you. We ask you, Lord. Speak to our hearts. May the words of our mouth, may the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shadow Observe the Lord's Supper with the kind of year we've had. We're going to use these uh, kind that are self-contained with the wafer and the stuff. So that's how we'll do it in case you're wondering. That'll be next Sunday morning. And uh, pray for our youth and our kids. Uh, um, we've got camp done, don't we, Danny? But uh, we won't say what happens next month. That'll just be next month. You know what's coming. So anyway, pray for our students and our teachers. All right, God bless you. We're glad you're here. Tom Benneke, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?